What's up guys, my name is Tony Cassano and I am currently competing in the MPC. I'm nationally qualified. I also have two daughters. I am engaged to a WWE wrestler. Um, so we're preparing for wedding. We flip houses, invest in real estate and compete in all in the mix. Um, so that's what I'm all about in a nutshell. And I'm really excited to be here. Well, like I said, I appreciate it. And it sounds like you have definitely a lot going on. And I think there's a lot of people out there who can, to some degree, uh, they can relate to that feeling of of being like, man, I have a, a career and a family and a XYZ thing I got to do this day. And I have this other thing. And it's like, when do I get to, you know, put put energy and put time into myself in a healthy perspective way. And, and I think that that's something that as you really dive into fitness more, we understand that it's not necessarily about giving it like an obsessive quality about it and becoming too ingrained in it or too worried about, you know, well, if I don't get a hundred percent of my daily goals done, then it's as, you know, a, um, a failure for the day, you know, for most people, you know, bodybuilding is a little bit different because you definitely for at least for that short prep period, you, you do want to be as on point as possible. But for most people, it's like, if you can be, you know, 80% every single day, that's better than a hundred percent some days and 0% other days. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually it's interesting. Everything we both just said with regards to competing and having a life you know, having other things going on, because I feel like I'm only just thinking about this now, actually, for the first time. But when you watch, I'm a big YouTube podcast. I listen to a lot, especially right now, because I'm doing so much cardio. <laughs> but you see these prep videos. And I mean, I'm mostly watching women, you know, but I'm watching girls prep videos, and their entire day is focused around prep. And it gives almost that perception that you can't work, you can't have anything else going in your life in order to prep and compete or, or, Focus on yourself, really, with whatever goal you have. Um, if you have other things going on, when in real life, for so many of us, we have kids. We have a house and laundry and animals and a job. And, you know, you can't end all of those things to just prep, you know, at the end of the day. Um, life still has to go on and you can still find, I don't want to say balance because it's hard to have balance in your life during prep. But prep is this much of my life. You know, like I still have 10,000 other things I'm doing throughout the day and you can make it part of your life and it doesn't have to be your entire life in order for you to succeed. If, if that makes sense. In our society in general, whether it's sports or not, it's like we label ourselves as a teacher or as a bodybuilder or as a insert your hobby or your job or your, your sport here instead of saying I'm a human being who does these things. And when we can really look at it from that perspective, yeah. I think we see that we can be more than just that thing. Absolutely. I mean, because if you say I'm a bodybuilder and that's, I'm Tony and I'm a bodybuilder. Well, what am I tomorrow if I decide not to compete anymore? Yeah. I'm still me just with different goals, you know? So I totally agree with what you just said. Absolutely. Are you a personal trainer, online fitness coach, or gym owner on the verge of burnout? Are you wanting to grow your fitness business, but can't add more hours to your hectic schedule? Introducing Trainer Revenue Multiplier, the premier wealth creation system for fitness professionals that helps you earn more and work less. Visit www.trainerrevenuemultiplier.com today to schedule your free business accelerator session. If you're serious about taking your business to the next level, schedule your call today. So obviously in, in kind of a, a, a way that we're, we're talking about our personality and kind of managing that, but we're also talking about time management. And so tell us a little bit about some of the ways that you've kind of learned to do that. You know, what are some of your tricks, if you want to call them that, or pieces of, of, of advice that you'd be willing to share for people out there who are struggling to be like, well, I want to do bodybuilding too, or I want to get into my fitness too, but I have all these other things. Listen, you find time for the things you want to find time for. Somebody can be as busy as ever. If you love to golf, you will find time to go golf. It's the same thing. And now listen, there's two sides to it. If you're somebody that's working, you have a home life and a family and kids and all of the things, and you don't work out at all. For me to sit here and say, it's realistic for you to go to the gym five times a week for one hour. That's five hours a week. Do you realistically, after getting up, you get your kids on the bus, you go to work all day, you pick them up late, probably from aftercare, bring them right home, unpack lunches, dinner, prep their food for the next I mean. 
have five hours a week right now where you're doing literally nothing in the middle of the day to go to the gym and work out? No. So you'll do that for three weeks and realize you're so far behind in so many other areas of your life that then you stop going to the gym. And that's the biggest cycle I've seen. Um, so that's like the one area that you need to, if you're not working out and you want to start adding it into your life, you need to do it slowly. Pick a couple of days, a couple of nights a week to go to the gym slowly add it in then once you get accustomed to that add in one more don't overwhelm yourself you need to think long term how can i build this into my lifestyle can you find the time yes absolutely it's going to take some rearranging um on the other side i feel like if you want to make it to the gym you will and i don't currently go to a nine to five but i always did up until last summer when i left my nine to five and i got up at like 3 45 in the morning when i was prepping to get to the gym by 4 15 to get an, a full hour of cardio plus my workout before starting work at 7.30. Work from 7.30 to four, oh, got my kids, did dinner, everything, put them to bed. And my spin bike was next to my bed. I would get on my spin bike for another 30 minutes or however much more cardio I had to do. And I would get right into bed right after. You find the time for the things you want to find the time for. Now, listen, having a new baby, I mean, I have two kids. It's going to be an adjustment. And if there's a little bit of time, you have to not make it to the gym because you have to be you know, supportive if you're going to work all day and you're partners at home with a newborn you want to you know she's going to need you to get home or he or whatever is going to need you to get home so that they could have a little break but I think giving that time to each other at least since you're past like that first few weeks of trying to adjust to this life but giving that time to each other and being supportive of all right I need my hour and then you can have your hour maybe it doesn't look like two hours at the gym I get it like when, when we're gym people, you go to the gym sometime, you're there for three hours and you're like, where did my whole afternoon go at the gym? You know, I totally get it. And you might have to have a little shift for a little while. And listen, we all go through chapters of our life and, you know, maybe this really watching your food. Maybe it's really getting out there and running every day, like something to definitely keep moving and keep something for yourself. You know, I think it's super important. And you mentioned those other things like staying hydrated or Maybe sleep is a little bit difficult when you have a newborn, but focusing on is getting as much sleep as you can and good quality sleep or really focusing on, okay, well, if I can't go work out, let me really just tweak my diet here and figure out, you know, what foods work best for me. Or maybe I've never even done that because I consider, you know, my workout, my, like, there's so many people out there who think, oh, if I work out an hour, if I work out X amount of time for a day or a week or whatever. I can eat whatever I want. I can live. Yeah. I can eat whatever I want. I can go out and, you know, drink and party yeah. and I can do all this other stuff because my workouts cover me. I can, I can consider myself healthy now. So I think when you take that away and I've actually had a little bit of an experience of having to take that away here in the past few months, I've actually been more conscious. I feel like of my health and my fitness from other perspectives. Yeah. I did the same thing. I mean, how many of us, we go to the gym every day, but are you eating the right things? Or are you leaving and going to Chipotle, calling it a healthy lunch? Like, you know, are you drinking enough water? Probably not. So there's so many ways to be healthy as a whole besides the gym. I actually just put a post up about this earlier today. I think um, there's so many pieces to being healthy and living a healthy fit lifestyle in general. Working out is like yeah. a small one. For sure. So yeah. how did you actually tell us a little bit about how, how you actually got into the sport of bodybuilding to begin with? So mommy actually goes back many years. Um, by the time I was 21, I opened up my first CrossFit gym. Um, when I was 23, I opened up my second. This was back in New York. And when I was 28, I sold them both. I moved to Jersey, which is where I still live now. Um, and when I moved, I decided I was going to work out for myself because I felt like my love for, I mean, I used to train much different. I was a CrossFit athlete. I competed in the games. Um, that was my path back then. So it was definitely a different style of working out, but it became a business instead of my hobby and like my safe thing that I just enjoy doing. So when I moved out here, I decided I would never train clients again. I would never work back in a gym. And I just worked out for me and I didn't join a CrossFit gym. I joined a regular gym. So that was kind of when my training transformed from like the CrossFit, go hard, heavy Olympic lifts to more of a bodybuilding style training. Now competing, something I love doing, I, no matter what I'm doing it at, I just want to compete and push myself. So once I started working out, like just in the gym and started following other people's, you know, other women's journeys, really, um, they all compete. So I was like, oh man, I need to compete. So now this is my third year. And that was how I kind of transformed. I hired a coach first thing. And I was like, I want to do a show. I didn't do it necessarily the right way, 
but I was like, I want to do a show. And four months later, I first one. And here we are, um, three years later. <laughs> and I did the first one just to see if I would like it. You know, I just wanted that little push. And I realized, wow, like this is what I'm meant to do. It seems like there's so many people who have that experience of like, they want to get into it. And then they, they have like a weird first experience or like a, because bodybuilding is, is more, I think that you go into it with this perception of like, all right, well, it's going to be a lot of working out and I got to diet in some way. And you don't take into consideration like so many of the variables or how you like, even that those variables are going to have an impact, you know, or how, how am I going to set my life up to make sure that this works out in, you know, in a, in a good way um, or, or a lot of this stuff. And it's just kind of interesting to hear you say that as well. Was, was bodybuilding something though, that when you did start to really kind of get into it and start to understand it, I guess a little bit more, was it something that at certain points you ever considered like too much? Every other day. Yeah. So I have this constant, I feel like there's so many different avenues and, and different bullet points I could say here around competing. On one hand, I love the control that I feel I have. When I'm in prep, it's the only time I am focused so much on what I'm putting in my body, how much water I'm drinking. If I want my body to change like this, I do this and it works. You are in total control. You are in control over, do I want to follow my meal plan today or do I want to cheat and not? Do I want this result or that result? You choose. You are in total control. I love that. Are there some days where I am not sitting down eating food with my family and my kids are like, when are you going to have dinner with us again? Or I'm sick of making multiple different meals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in my house because I have to eat my food or not going out with friends or going to my best friend's wedding and not being able to eat or drink, going away for her bachelorette party and bringing my own food. And am I like, I'm like, I'm missing out on big moments in my life for this show that like, why am I even doing this? Why am I hungry all the time and irritable and cranky? And I snap at people because I'm cranky and irritable. And why am I doing this? Like for what? You know, so it, I really go back and forth, but I am mentally much happier with myself when I'm in prep and I feel like I'm following a plan than when I'm just out there living life and not, you know, yeah, I get to go out to dinner on a Friday night and have a glass of wine. But um, in the long run, I'm much better mentally in prep. What is that what for you? Like, can you say, what am I doing this for? Why am I doing this? What is that answer for you? What is my why? And that's what I'm, that's what I do struggle with. Um, but really what my why is building my brand, building myself to a place where giving myself the credibility in this industry in order for me to turn it my lifelong career, essentially, even if it's not actually competing is not my lifelong career. However, building myself a brand and showing that I can do this and I can stick to my plan and I can come in and I can win and I can transform my body and that I have control over that and that other people can do it too. You know, if that makes sense, even in the busiest, I mean, I have 10,000 things going on, but um, in the beginning, I like needed that constant motivation to like keep reminding myself why. And this time around, this is the first year that I don't need that at all. And my why is just for myself to show that I can do it to other people and to myself, but mostly to myself. And cause that gives you the confidence when you set a goal and you achieve it, it gives you confidence. And that's, what's gotten you so far, even in other areas of my life. We would be in a, a much better world if, if people would, I guess, just really do the things we should be doing and know that we should be doing. Well, I saw this meme the other day and it was said, so, I'm going to butcher it, but it said something along the lines of if I walk in with a container with egg whites, like to an office for work. And that's my breakfast, like egg whites and plain oatmeal on the side. I'm looked at as the odd one out. Like, oh, you're so healthy. Oh, you're always on a diet. Meanwhile, if every other person around me ate pastry, donuts, and, you know, big 100 calorie lattes from Starbucks, no one looks at them or has anything to say. Like that's the normal, but eating whole good foods for your body is the not normal. Like, I, I mean, it was a me, so it was much shorter than that. But if you think about that concept, that's really what our society has turned into. And it's crazy. Like you can eat literally cake and donuts for breakfast or a little cheese Danish with a 450 calorie latte from Duncan. And that's normal and totally accepted. And nobody will think twice about, but you have my like steamed fish I bring for lunch and 
everyone wants to talk about it. You know what I mean? It's so crazy. Are you a personal trainer who wants to scale and grow your business online? Have you been coaching online for years, yet don't know how to incorporate online into your current business model? Introducing Trainer Revenue Multiplier, the premier wealth creation system for fitness professionals that helps you earn more and work less. Visit www.trainerrevenuemultiplier.com today to schedule your free business accelerator session. If you're serious about taking your business to the next level, schedule your call today. Yeah, I agree. I think there's there's so many norms that for whatever reason became normal. And, and I don't know, you know, if that's a can be attributed to like just the way that humans are. I don't know if it's that or I don't know if it's just been like a, a steady kind of like brainwashing of whatever, like culturally. Yeah. I don't know. Like, but it seems like to me there would be a almost like an anti evolutionary f- feature to the way that we're living now. I think that it's two part. I think that it's one people don't know. Like people look at Trader Joe's as a healthy food store and they think you can go into Trader Joe's and not question it, buy anything. You know, most things on the shelf are just as unhealthy as anything else in the food store. I mean, their version of Oreos are just as unhealthy as Oreos from the food store. So I think that's the first part is like the education. And I think that the second part is this addiction to the sugars and the additives and the the yellow and the red number five and the blue, like you actually, your body gets um, addicted to this stuff, especially like all the fruit fructose. And I don't know that much about it, but I know that it's, they're big, like, um, like you get addicted to that kind of stuff. And I, I've watched a ton of documentaries recently actually about this stuff and that kids actually act different when they consume these foods. So I think that has a big part of it. I think that we're actually being poisoned is really what I think. And I think that people just don't know any better because everywhere you look, it's so widely accepted that people think it's okay. Yeah, I'm big on whole foods and minimal meat and no chemicals in anything that I consume. So I, um, it's, it's crazy to me that people actually live off of this stuff. We have this like push and this is a little bit off tangent, but we have this like push for find the cure, do this, do that for the cure, race for the cure and all this stuff for like things like cancer, let's just say, which I think it's important to do those things. I think, you know, we need, we, it'd be great to have a cure for cancer, but for some reason, we're not spending the same amount of time, energy and money and effort into teaching people how not to get cancer in the first place. And I think that that's the complete, like, that's like the epitome of where we are in America at this point is like, let's just let people, you know, tell people or not tell people, I guess, how to live. And then when they get so bad, we're going to, you know, try to fix the problem when it's, at the, when it's at its worst. Right. Because they make so much. They, yeah. There's more money to be made in keeping people sick than having them just be healthy in the first place. Actually, I've got a good story I'll share um, about this topic. I brought my kids to the doctor two weeks ago for their yearly checkups. Now I am the worst when it comes to bringing my kids to the doctor because I don't get anything for them. I do it strictly because they want to play sports and they need that physical sign. That's it. Um, but I won't let them do anything. So the doctor was like, all right, for my 12 year old, we recommend doing blood work. We want to check her cholesterol. We want to check her, you know, blah, 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 blah. I was like, listen, she's perfectly healthy. There's no reason to start taking blood and checking these things. I was like, and I said it to her and she definitely got upset with me. And I don't remember the exact way I said it, but it was something along the lines of the, the health industry cares so much about taking blood from a 12 year old to check their cholesterol. They should put that much more money instead of doing that into making sure that 12 year old is eating healthy snacks when they go to school and not serving donuts, chips and soda out of the vending machine. Like that's where my, and she, I mean, what is she going to say? She had nothing to say, but it just shows it right there. All the tests they want to run on little kids, you know, that are seemingly perfectly healthy, but they want to run them because they can charge for them and they can get money from them. It's all a business. Um, Whereas they would rather make food that's cheap and fast to make and can last for three years on a shelf because then once again, the food companies make more money that way. So that's definitely how I feel for it. I actually feel like it's truly not fair to people, to this society as a whole, the foods that are being fed to them. It, it shouldn't be illegal. It's bizarre. It be illegal. There was something on TikTok the other day, it compared frosted flakes, I forget, a whole bunch of like, 
like foods, you know, Cheetos, I don't know, whatever, a whole bunch of um, very common garbagey foods that we have. And then it compared the same food in a different country. I think it was Australia, but I, I might be wrong. And it compared the ingredients list. It was even like Heinz ketchup and the ingredients list because so many of the chemicals are banned in their country. I'm forgetting what country, I think Australia. So many of them are banned. It was Heinz ketchup in US had ingredients 30 long. In the other country, it was like five ingredients. And it went through like, I know Frosted Flakes was definitely on there. And in our country, it had like 10,000 ingredients. And in the other one, it had like five. And it's because all of these chemicals and additives and stuff they're putting in our food is not allowed in the other countries. Somebody was telling my fiance recently about McDonald's. They were like, you have to have McDonald's in, I want to say Italy, but I, I might be butchering that once again, another country. And they were like, it's totally different food. It's so good. It's so fresh. You wouldn't even think it was like the same thing. And it's because they're not allowed to have all the stuff we're allowed to have here, which is just sickening. Like they're trying to poison us. That's crazy. And yeah. uh, I was actually kind of doing a, a little deep dive and, and, uh, stuff that they, you know, they put into our meats to preserve our meats. And that kind of like, just completely shook me up, you know, just to hear like all these different chemicals. Cause I, I just had this perception of like, okay, well, if I'm eating a meat, you know, there should be just like, you just look at it right there and it's, it looks like meat, right? But meat. yeah, but there's no. preservatives and additives for the texture and additives for the color and additives for the flavor and additives for this and that. And I was just like, that's just crazy that I had a regenerative farmer on here a couple, uh, you know, probably months back now, but he was talking about like the, just the, the agricultural system in general and how like we think that we're eating meat from the United States, right? They're getting these meats from all over the world, whether that be, you know, um, I think they were like Australia was maybe one or wherever else. And it was just for the simple reason that it's cheaper for whatever reason to ship it from all the yeah. way across the ocean. And like what that does to not just the food that has like this stuff in it, but also like the environment, like why do we need to waste all these things on shipping meat across the ocean when we can literally just like most, most cities, like not all cities, but most cities have a smaller, you know, town and, and farm out, you know, land outside of the city just to me, it would make more sense to just be more sustainable, be more self-sustainable. It's just the whole thing to me is just mind blowing how it's kind of set up. Oh, I, I mean, listen, I made a talk about this stuff for years. I actually, we buy our chicken. We, we only eat chicken in my house and we get it from, um, there's actually like this, these two men, they're married, live 15 minutes from us and they have chickens there and they get them in and raise them for seven weeks. And then they have them butchered. They have someone come in and butcher them. And then they freeze the meat and then you could just pull up and there's a little shed and you could just buy the chicken. That's actually where we get it from. I know that there's nothing in it, but you can't live like that. Have you ever watched Cowspiracy? I feel like that is something everybody needs to watch. That forks over knives. Um, there's another really good one that I can't remember off the top. What the hell? Have you ever seen it? I've heard of What the Health, but I don't think I've ever seen any of them. What the Health is on Netflix right now. So is Cowspiracy. One of them talks about how, because you eat, people eat so much meat now, they can't even grow enough cows and chickens and lamb anymore to supply the demand because of how much meat people are eating. Like with every meal, you're not supposed to do that. So they can't even grow enough. And it's not because they can't grow enough of the animals. It's because they can't grow enough of the food to feed the animals or get enough water to give the animals the water. Um, and that was like, they're knocking down rainforests in like Brazil, I think right now to build hay fields, to just grow hay. I, I could be butchering this, but it's something along the lines, but it's the food to feed the cows. And they were comparing it to if people would just not eat meat and or as much meat at least, and use all the rainforests that they're knocking down instead of growing grain for the animals. And they just grew vegetables. <laughs> Everyone could eat. <laughs> And yeah. cheaper and it was crazy there's um a new show another one just came out on netflix about blue zones have you ever heard of them no it's like um blue zones are there's certain areas there's five i think right now in the world if i'm remembering correctly um and they're called the blue zone and it's where the most amount of people living over 100 years old live it's called like into the blue i think into the blue zone something like that um it's a documentary and it's got episode is a different one of the blue zones one's Costa Rica one's in China I forgot one's in Greece 
And it's like one tiny little area. And he goes there and visits and he's like, what are you guys doing that you're able to live to 100? And they'll, they'll show like a whole room of women, 105 years old, hanging out, playing cards, dancing, doing karaoke. And he's like, what do you eat? What do you do every day? And all of them, meat is very small in their diet. They eat lots of potatoes, rice, vegetables, like just simple food. They're making it all at home. They're like very old fashioned towns where like you can't get fast food or anything like that. And he was like, what's the secret to living so old and not only living so old, but being so healthy. There's no diabetes. There's no obesity. There's no um, Alzheimer's, dementia, heart disease, none of it. And like, what is the secret? And they're all pretty much the same, say the same thing. It's little meat, lots of vegetables, lots of starches, um, no chemicals in their diet. And they stay super active. Like they're going to the river to get their water every day. And um, what was the fourth thing? I think it was like love and community and like laughing. They like all, every older person in every one of these cities said that. Like it was still getting together with friends and having fun and laughing and doing things and being active. That was like another big part of it. And I think this guy, he made the whole documentary because his goal was to, he bought a small town in the United States I, Michigan, maybe I forget where. And he wanted to create a blue zone, like somehow figure out how to do it. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I think too, it's like when we look at societies that are set up that way, we almost feel bad. Like in America, we feel bad. Like we take pity on those people who have to go and, you know, get their water from here and do, you know, don't have as much technology or don't utilize it or, you know, don't have access to Chick-fil-A or, you know, like we feel bad for those people, but then we have such the, such like terrible outcomes for our lives and for our health. You know, why do we have such a high suicide rate? Why do we have, you know, people who are, don't know how to take care of themselves, even if, you know, they, they, they wanted to, they could, I'm not saying that, but even if they wanted to, it's like, they're already so far gone or they have these, you know, chronic diseases or, just so many things like that we have mm -hmm. as bad outcomes here. We think it's, it's fine and dandy because we can, you know, get on TikTok or we can, you know, watch Netflix or we can do all these things that we consider entertainment. When in reality, like when you look at these other places, they just seem to be happier and healthier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look around, look at every person, you know, I feel like everyone I talk to these days is unhappy, yeah. unhappy, mental illness, depressed, I mean, it's like a fight to not fall into that. You know, I watch it now, like with my kids and my older one has TikTok and I'm just like, I don't want her falling into that comparison and feeling bad about herself. Because if you were to look on TikTok as a 12 year old, I mean, come on. And I'm just like, that's not real life. And you're comparing yourself to that. You're never going to be happy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting. I have this theory and I definitely heard it from somewhere. It's not my own theory, but it stuck with me. And it was just... Your brain is not supposed to be exposed to so much and so many people. And I think that it's trickled into, I've had so many conversations recently about this and how it like affects different areas of life. And, but one of the big ones being, you know, I think that there's so much depression and, you know, just unhappiness with your life because you're comparing your life to every other fake perfect looking life because nobody's life is perfect right what we see on instagram isn't really a portrayal of their life you're getting the highlight reel so um you know i think your brain's just not it cannot handle it it goes into like freak out mode and can't handle it you know if you think about back in the day who were you exposed to your family your neighbors people from work and that was it you weren't seeing every other perfect looking body on Instagram in the entire world, hundreds at the, the click of a hat and then comparing yourself. You were comparing yourself, if you were comparing yourself at all, really, because you weren't like looking at images in front of your face and sit there and compare. Um, I think that's got the biggest thing to do with it. It's so messed up, but I think about it a, a lot and enough and I have a really good grip on it now. I'm also older and it definitely affected me different when I was younger, but the older I get, the more I really have a grip on it. And it, I can see it now from the outside looking in instead of being in it, if that makes any sense. And I really think your brain is not meant to see all of that. But it, it's sad because it could be used for such like a great tool, you know, for communication and connection and for, you know, inspiration and motivation. Mm -hmm. Because even mm -hmm. though you see those people who may, 
have more than you or know something you don't or X, Y, Z that you think you want, like that could be used as like a, a tool for, okay, well, what are they doing to get it? Let me learn about it. And instead it's like, oh man, they have something I want. Now I'm just going to, you know, continue to to sit on my phone and never try to get it. I it's totally hard. agree. It's sad because I, I definitely agree. It could, it's such a good thing for so many reasons, but it's also such a bad thing. <laughs> For so many people, unfortunately, yeah. because they, they're they not in the mindset to do what you said. Tell us a little bit about how you maintain, and I guess even, even before you maintain it, how you attain it. So it's so interesting, and I'm still honestly trying to figure out how this happened to me. I was always one, it's my easiest to compare it, to talk about this when it comes to bikini prep, because... It's, it's very easy photos you see and what girls look like. And it's very easy to compare. In the past, I would sit there and I would pick apart my, my body. And I would go to every other girl that I knew competed's page. And I would be like, ah, oh, this looks perfect on her. That looks perfect on her. What's her, not what's her secret, but like, she's better than me. And I did that. I was in it. Um, I never let it get to my brain that much. It was very superficial. It never really like, Hurt me or did any damage to my own brain, but I found myself doing it. The last two years, I didn't do it at all. And now I like look at other girls. I won't specifically go to there and I try not to be on Instagram much. I actually don't really touch my phone if I'm in my house at all. Um, I try very hard to just like, I'll leave it in a room for hours and hours and I get yelled at for it all the time, but I hate my cell phone. But now I will see another girl. I'll be like, oh, wow. She looks great. And then I just envision myself being that. And I'm like, what am I going to look like on stage when I'm shredded? What am I going to look like after all that hard work I just put in these last eight months in building my glutes? Like, what am I going to look like? And that is automatically where my brain goes. And I wish I had some like great answer or like a book I read that did that for me, but there's not. Um, I don't know if it's, I, I truly feel like it's because I'm just getting older. And I feel like my time in comparing myself and feeling bad about myself is done. And I feel more confident as I get older. And although it could be this, actually, when you set a goal and you achieve it, it throws your confidence through the roof. Whether that goal is I'm going to work out every day this week and you complete it. It is I'm going to go run four miles today and you complete it. I'm going to hire a coach. He's going to give me a meal plan. and I'm going to friggin' stick to it for one year and you complete it. Your confidence goes through the roof. I'm to a point where I know if I do what I'm supposed to do, I will hit my goal. I'm on that journey. I've done it already. That, that gave me so much confidence that now I'm just at a place where I don't compare myself and Instagram does no damage to me. It definitely used to do, you know, it played with my head a little bit, not anymore. And I wish I had like a very solid answer, but I think age and completing goals that you start is the best way to get there. It's kind of like everything else, right? It's just a matter of so. like doing it. It's just a matter of getting out there and, and experiencing something, trying something, committing to something. It doesn't matter if it's bodybuilding or it doesn't matter if it's starting a business or it no. doesn't matter if it's any aspect of your health. Just get out there, do it, learn from it. And don't do what looks cool on Instagram. Do what you actually want to do. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, because a lot of times I, like, I think there's even times when I'm like, attracted to something to want to do something to want to try something and then you know is that something that I really wanted or is that something that looked cool or is that something that everybody else is doing or do I even care about that do you like it's easy because bodybuilding is so aesthetic where it's like oh man I want to look like that or it'd be great to have you know to the to be shredded or be great to you know be muscular or whatever and then you you start to do those things and it's, it's so hard to do them because you don't really have that true why behind it. This podcast is sponsored by Smoking Gun Coffee, a veteran-owned coffee company that strives to give back to those in need. Don't forget to use code TWR10 for a 10% discount at checkout. Absolutely. I used to have a funny story. I'll share this. So earlier this year, I had it in my mind. I've always wanted to own a pizzeria, always. So um, we were wrapping up a flip house we had. And I was like, that's it. Now's my time. I'm going to open up a pizzeria. And we start looking at commercial real estate. I go to my favorite pizzeria out back in Long Island. I meet with the owner. I get the recipes. He's going to teach me how to make the pizza that he makes so I can bring it here to my small little town. 
and I'm gung ho. I'm looking at real estate. I'm going, I'm trying to make deals happen. I'm sourcing ovens and I, I'm gung ho on making it happen. And then I realized I was like, wait a minute. I have no one to run it. I have no one to make the pieces. That means I can definitely get somebody to make the pizzas. You know, you hire a chef to make the pizzas. Like, but I'm going to have to be at the pizzeria every day. Like, I've worked on every other area of my life. So I don't have to be tied down to working in a physical location every single day. Why would I do that? And that I, I was so gung ho on it thinking, this is what I want. This is what I want until it came down to like, figuring out the nitty gritty details of how it's going to be every day. And I was like, this is not even close to what I want. Like not, I don't want to have to go to a pizzeria because my employee called out and I have to, or I have to be there to watch the money because you can't trust anybody. Like, no, that sounds terrible. So it's just like, sometimes things are in your mind and you really do think that you want it. It's not like you're pretending to want it, but you have to know the deep down in and outs of why you want to do something you know, if you're going to commit to it. Yeah. And listen, bodybuilding is a different thing. You need to try it. I, I, I said anybody like if bodybuilding is something you've thought about doing it, just do it because you're never going to know if you like it or not until you do it. And you are going to be so freaking proud of yourself, whether you compete for the rest of your life or you never compete again. If it's something you wanted to do, commit to it, do it. It's three months, do your prep, do it for yourself. Something you always wanted to do. You don't, it's not a lifelong thing. You're not losing tremendous amounts of things or money or time if you do one and you decide you don't like it you're still going to gain the confidence from completing a goal but with other things in your life if you're trying to build up your confidence don't just pick something because you think it's cool or because you think it sounds like fun like me with the pizzeria make sure it's truly what you want deep down all parts of it before you throw yourself in it's this thing to where even if you don't like it, you learn a lot about yourself and you learn a lot about what you're capable yeah, of. Absolutely. You have nothing to lose. Is there a kind of a, like a grand plan for you in terms of like, I want to do bodybuilding for this long and then I want to step into this other thing. And then, you know, is there anything like that? So I'm in a little bit of a weird place right now because I'm getting older and I'm getting married next year, early next year. And I think we want to have kids. So that will change everything. And if that's something that we, I will keep competing until I can. But if I'm going to have more kids, then I will not compete probably anymore. Um, I mean, maybe like another day later on in the future, but then my, my shift and this chapter of my life will be over. And the, you know, it's, it, competing is very selfish. And everyone around you is affected. And I know for me, I cannot be my best when I am starving, when I'm doing so much cardio, when it is just on my mind, when I need to eat my next meal and I have to be home. And I, so this chapter of my life will be over if we decide to have children. If we don't, um, well, my point to me getting older is that I, if we do that, it would have to be in the near future. So like I said, I already have um, a 12 year old and an eight year old. So it would have to be in the near future. So if we don't, then I don't know. I guess it depends on how well the rest of this prep goes, how this entire year goes. My plan is to do as many shows as I can because I want to stay in prep probably. I mean, it depends on how we do in the shows. If they're like, listen, you need so much more muscle, go home and take a year off and build, then I will do that. But if I can get four or five shows out of this prep, because I've been in it for a very, very long time already. I started back in February. Um, if I can get a solid four or five shows out, possibly start working towards my pro card for next year, that would be great. And then we'll kind of see where it goes from there. Gotcha. Have a plan, but let your plan be moldable and change. And don't commit so hard to something because then when you expect to have one thing happen and your expectation isn't met, you are let down or crushed or, you know, you need to regain plan. Like our life is ever evolving and you have to just roll with it to be happy. My coach literally calls it a daily checklist. He's like, just keep checking those boxes. That's it. Don't worry. We didn't pick a show. We didn't pick nothing. And it's just every day that we get up, we just water check, green drink check, meal one check. And we just check the boxes every day. 
you just worry about every day as it comes. Yeah. I think that when you do that, you, you become a little bit more passionate too about actually like doing the thing instead of just getting to the end. I totally agree. And I've definitely heard other people say this too. Like if you don't enjoy the journey and you don't enjoy you know, your meals and the process and watching, you know, if you don't enjoy it and you go through all of this stress, you're on stage for like three seconds and you can be in prep. I'm in like almost 30 weeks right now. I mean, if I was doing it for the end game for the show day, oh my God, not worth it. Definitely not worth it. And I think that goes for everything in your life. You know, like you gotta just like the the daily grind of it or else you're going to be unhappy, you know? Yeah. You're putting too much pressure on, on not the right thing. It's so crazy the way you only have one life. And I think about like people that are maybe like in jail for life. I've been watching a lot of true crime and I'm like, how do you, you only have one life and you're going to spend the next 40 years in jail. I mean, the job situation is the same thing. Like it's just, it's crazy to me. What made it really easy for me, maybe this contributed to my happiness too. When we were talking about earlier, like how am I able to just be happy and confident and not the social media thing doesn't get to me. Um, How? This may be part of it too. I think to myself almost on a daily basis, you only have one life. So who cares? Like, what does it matter? Like if something upsets me, I very quickly snap out of it and I'm like, Who cares? You know, if something bad happened this morning, actually, I was backing out of my driveway and in my fiance's brand new car and I ran over a rock, like uh, not even, I shouldn't call it a rock. It was a a big boulder on the side of my driveway and I hit it and I popped her tire in two seconds. I got to the end of my block to put the baby on the bus and got off and the entire tire was flat by the time I got 30 seconds up the driveway. And she looked at me and she laughed and she was like, what are you going to do? The car's like two weeks old. And she's like, what are you going to do? Like, and she just laughed and I got, I was like, I'm so sorry. I just did that. And she was like, whatever. And I was just like, I thought about it so many times today, all day long. And I was like, that's just so great. Like, yeah, whatever. You have one life to live. Who cares about a flat tire? Like, Who cares? Yeah. Who cares what someone else is doing on Instagram? Right? Like, I don't know if you can like just put yourself in that mindset. And I think I just did it so often and so much. that just developed into who I am now. Perfect example. Like my daughter comes home every day now from school. She started school this week. So she comes home and every day it's the new drama with the girls at school. Today it was like, they got up, they moved the lunch table. They were giving us dirty looks. We were giving them dirty looks. I just want to be like, and like, that was what her takeaway from school was today. And I was just like, who cares? <laughs> Not who cares to the sense, like, I understand exactly what you're saying, where it can send you down like a depression, but I mean like the negative, the small negative things. If you look at like the big scheme of your life, who cares that the girls text us were giving us dirty looks because we took their lunch table, like whatever, like, and keep it moving. You know, you'd be a much happier person. I think life would be so much easier if you could just impart, be able to impart so wisdom much easier. That to a kid, you know? It would be so much easier. They don't get it. So (laughs) I try. (laughs) They don't get it. It's just when you think about like the big scheme of your life, like if you can think about it, like when you find yourself getting upset over something or comparing yourself in a negative way or talking to yourself negative. I say to myself all the time in the mirror, I used to be like, oh, your stretch marks. Oh, your skin is loose in your stomach. Now I look at myself and I'm like, you look great. Like, and I keep, keep it moving. You know, like, I'm like, who cares about my stretch marks? There's two ways, I guess, to look at everything and you just got to say it enough times and it really does. I guess I'm the proof that it works because it's the only things I could, only these little things I could think of that made a difference in my life. Thank you for coming on the podcast. It was, it was great getting to talk to you. We kind of hit on a yeah. little bit of a diversity of subjects and, and some <laughs> things that I'm very passionate about. So it was great getting to chat. Yeah, no, it definitely was. It went all over the place, this conversation. If you want to share your social media or, you know, anything like that, you can go ahead and do that. Absolutely. You guys can find me on Instagram at fit underscore Tony Casano. If you're tired of searching for a coach or trainer, somebody who knows what they're talking about and has experience, make sure you go check out the new Coaches Corner on weightroompodcast.com. You can find quality, qualified coaches to help you achieve your goals, whether that's in bodybuilding or just general fitness. Stop wasting time and start achieving your goals today. 
The link to the Coach's Corner is down in the description below.